Good evening, everyone. I'm Louise Mirror, President and CEO of the New York Historical Society, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you back to the History Hour, a live virtual program presented each Thursday evening exclusively for members and other supporters of our organization. Tonight's program is titled Uniform Courage, Outfitting the Civil War Soldier. As always, I want to take a moment to thank our trustees, our chairman's council, and other members, and all of the supporters who are watching this program this evening. Thank you so very much for your great generosity. These are challenging times for cultural institutions, and we really, truly do appreciate your support. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Valerie Paley is Senior Vice President and Chief Historian at New York Historical. She also directs our Center for Women's History. Harold Holzer is the author, co-author, or editor of more than 50 books on Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War era, including the Civil War and 50 Objects on which this program is based. I want to thank all of you once again for joining us, and now it is my pleasure to hand it over to Valerie and Harold. Good evening and welcome everyone and thank you Louise. Uh, before we dive into tonight's topic, just a few housekeeping reminders. Tonight's program, which is being recorded, will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers. Please submit your questions via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any time during the talk. We will get to as many as possible toward the end of the program. We have disabled the chat function, so you will want to use the Q&A function instead. So now, Civil War fashion. Uh, this series has been investigating the power of objects to be emblematic of historical events and to help us understand the past. Uh, as a historian at New York Historical, I work alongside these treasures every day, and it is my great privilege to use them in exhibitions as well. But Harold, let's tell our audience a bit about the inspiration for our program, the book Civil War and 50 Objects. How can only 50 objects tell such a sweeping story? Well, um, as the cover shows, we, we managed to vary uh, medium, message, uh, tactile objects, images, <laughs> but probably as you um, force us to describe this as Civil War fashion, I'll get you for that later, but um, <laughs> the hardest things to preserve are that you know better than most are textiles and um, the, the objects we're going to discuss today, some of them are really extraordinary in terms of how they've survived. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let's get to our four things uh, this right. evening. Uh, we have a Zouave uniform, some military buttons, a foot locker, and a drum. Uh, very interesting and in fashion, maybe, maybe not, but, uh, <laughs> but in aggregate, uh, they do tell the story of uniform courage outfitting the Civil War soldier. Uh, let's start with this, the Zouave uniform. So surviving uniforms, uh, or textiles for that matter, as you say, in fine condition uh, from the Civil War are very rare. Uh, and this one uh, is impeccably preserved um, and it's unique. Uh, it's you have to admit, a pretty kooky looking costume to wear into combat. Can you tell us about this outfit? Sure, so this, uh, as you say, is a Zouave uniform, and believe it or not, the soldiers who wore these duds uh, were considered the toughest dudes in the Union or Confederate Army. Um, uh, they wore these baggy pantaloons, sashes, short jackets, um, uh, you see the leggings, and what we don't see is that they also wore a fez with a tassel on top. So these uniforms were modeled after um, uh, Zouave uniforms that the French in turn adapted from the Moroccans. So it became kind of a French Foreign Legion look and noted for fierceness. And um, so 25 Confederate regiments and 75 Union regiments started the war in this costume until they, somebody kind of figured out that they were pretty easy targets in, these, <laughs> in this outfit. So that, it sort of declined, but all through the war they were worn, as impractical as they looked. 
But there's a strange incongruity between uh, the combat fierceness of the Zouave soldiers and uh, and the way they were dressed. Uh, you said uh, you say in the book that they look like uh, harem dancers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's curious. Who popularized this style? So. Um... Really, we can give credit to a New Yorker uh, from Utica. Uh, his name was Elmer Ephraim Ellsworth. Um, I know we have a picture of him coming up. And uh, he was a, uh, a drill master. And maybe we should do the next slide so people can take a yes. look. There he is. There he is. And you see, he, was not, he did not wear the Zouave, but his cadets did. And he organized a brigade that did... Uh, shows on stages across the country. Very celebrated show in Chicago. And what his Zouabs did was they ran double time around the stage in circles. They broke off sort of like cheerleaders or, or the way um, a, a bands march at football stadiums where they break off and they jump up. His guys had rifles. They would cock the rifles. They would put it at their shoulders. And anyway, it was very well-received, and he became something of a celebrity at a very young age. He also uh, was a law student uh, of Abraham Lincoln's in his law office and was his bodyguard when he traveled to Washington from Springfield to become president. So they were acquaintances and then organized a unit when the war started uh, and uh, got into the fray really before it actually started for most people. And uh, as the war, go well, at, at the very beginning of the war, Ellsworth turns out to be a war hero and a, actually a kind of a martyr. Uh, would you uh, tell our audience why? Yeah, in fact, he was the first uh, uh, war hero for the North. So um, when the war started, when uh, Fort Sumter uh, fell, a federal, the federal authorities wanted to secure the Virginia side of the river opposite Washington, D.C. And that meant Alexandria to start. And Ellsworth was a frequent guest at the White House and playing with the Lincoln boys on the roof of the White House, he noticed a huge Confederate flag flying in Alexandria. He could see it with a telescope. By the way, I've seen the, the remains of this flag. It was big. So he decided to march his Zouaves across the bridge to the other side of the Potomac as the Union forces captured Alexandria. He went to this hotel, he marched up the stairs to the roof, he tore the flag down, he put it over his shoulders, and he descended the staircase. And as he got midway, the proprietor of this hotel, who was named Thomas, he was, his name was um, James Jackson, he was a relative of the man who would soon become Stonewall Jackson a couple of months later at Bull Run. And uh, Jackson shot Ellsworth dead. And then Ellsworth's men shot Jackson dead. So there are actually two martyrs created in one day, one for defending a Confederate flag, one for ripping it down. Uh, Lincoln was devastated. He gave Ellsworth a funeral in the East Room of the White House. His family attended. He wrote a very famous letter of condolence to Ellsworth's parents, uh, and uh, it was a great tragedy for the family. And as you say, I think we can see in this next um, image that uh, there were prints and uh, paintings of Ellsworth, song sheet covers, um, maybe not the most accurate depictions in the world, but they elevated this poor young guy into a martyr, as you noted, overnight. Well, we noticed that, that the, one of the soldiers is wearing a Zouave costume, but he isn't himself. So this is kind of interesting. We couldn't find right. a picture he never of him did. in this I costume. don't think he did. I think he always <laughs> wore the regular uniform, but his soldiers wore the Zouave uniforms. So our own uh, uh, Zouave uniform in the collection of New York Historical it was owned by one David P. Davis. Let's just see the uniform again. We know that he mustered into service at Fort, Fort Schuyler in the Bronx and served for two years. Um, where did he see action? Uh, do we have, we have a sense of that, do we not? Yeah, um, he was in um, a, a unit, by the way, that was called the Red-Legged Devils. So <laughs> you could see that, again, they took pride in this uniform and they combined the flamboyance of the uniform with their toughness. And he did see a lot of action. He was on the Virginia Peninsula with the McClellan Army in its failed attempt uh, 
to capture Richmond in early 1862. He was uh, in the Battle of Second Bull Run. And on and on, he was at um, um, Antietam in September 62, Fredericksburg in December 62, one of the worst Union defeats, and finally um, ended his service in Chancellorsville, Virginia, in May, in May 1863, so almost up until the Battle of Gettysburg before he mustered out, and as we see, uniform intact, no holes, no tearing. <laughs> So that's why he, we were able to get it at the Historical Society. Well, it's, it's a phenomenal object. Uh, next, we have uh, something a bit different. Uh, these are military buttons mounted on a card. And uh, this is also an interesting relic of the war in that soldiers were avid collectors of souvenirs of their service. Uh, these were easy to acquire mementos from battlefields, but uh, Reputedly, they also took them by stealing personal property from helpless civilians or prisoners yeah. or even corpses. Uh, tell us about the fellow who uh, collected these buttons. Well, what this kind fellow, of souvenir um, hunter was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we know, as you say, that, um, sorry about choking up. I'm not choking up with emotion, <coughs> but with allergies. So, yeah, it's kind of a macabre hobby. Um, but a clever one, because the buttons were really amazing. Each state had its own, each unit had its own. And this, these are union collected buttons uh, by an enterprising uh, uh, soldier who, um, his name was Fred Mather, or Mather, and he was in the 7th New York, which was a pretty elite uh, regiment. And we know that uh, he was also at uh, an extraordinary number of um, actions, including Spotsylvania, which was bloody. But as you say, they would snatch these from wounded and dead um, servicemen on the field. And we also have evidence um, that they, some may have even taken them from, from, from shallow graves. There was such, a, such an interest in, in getting them. Also, you mentioned prisoners. So, it was considered one of the worst insults that you could render to a prisoner of war is to rip a button off the uniform. So that was, you know, partially humiliation and partially this, this mania for collectibles. Let's see uh, just a, a, a typical photograph of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, of the, of, uh, the kinds yeah. of scenes that uh, that this collector would have uh, taken the buttons off of these jackets very macabre right. indeed and he uh, would have been you know totally have... sorry he just would have been totally uninhibited about walking up and down this line of corpses awaiting burial and you know they also took ammunition they mm -hmm. took guns they took shoes they whatever they could grab mm -hmm. uh we have another collection too which uh, uh sort of supplements uh, the uh, the buttons that the first se uh, selection of buttons. If we can see the other slide, here are some other Confederate buttons from a variety of sources, um, yeah. which are, you know, they're quite beautiful. And uh, it's interesting, we, we noted that they, these are from 1860, so before the war, presumably because they were created for the uh, uniforms. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so Lincoln himself received some gifts of war, uh, of souvenirs such as these and others, but what sorts of relics did he receive? Well, he got um, a cane made from the hull of the um, old Ironsides. He got uh, uh, a, another relic from the burned hull of the, of the Merrimack, the ship we discussed last week that battled Monitor. He got some faded translucent leaves from the Battle of Gettysburg uh, that had been allegedly bloodied in the, in the frenzy of battle in July. He got them in the fall when the leaves were falling off the trees and turning. So he, got, he got socks, he got soap, he got any Bibles, canes, walking sticks, anything, every, everything you can imagine. As, as he said to his wife once when another suit arrived um, unsolicited from a tailor. He said, uh, uh, Mary, if there's one thing we're going to get out of this, it's new clothes. <laughs> Unfortunately, she took him to heart and thought that meant 
she should run up the credit card bill. <laughs> Which she did. <laughs> Which she did. Uh, our, our next object uh, also is, is uh, not clothing, per se, or fashion, but a footlocker with belongings. Um, there was nothing luxurious by any stretch of the imagination in living in the field during, during the Civil War. Uh, but, but the experience of generals is very different from that of privates. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, generals, of course, had their own tents and servants and beds and chairs. I think our friend William Payne here is a step below. He was a cartographer. He was a map maker. Very important in battle in terms of quickly sketching out terrain. So he got this kind of, it looks rustic, but it's really an amazingly utilitarian footlocker. Think of the very best um, um, carry-on that you can take on an airplane, if anyone can remember doing that. Um, <laughs> this is the Civil War era equivalent of a great carry-on. And you can see, uh, because this has been beautifully photographed with a lot of its contents, it had his epaulettes on top there. Uh, it's got flags, it's got his own souvenirs, it's got medals. And it has his tools of the trade. You see a, um, a, a map making tool there. I forget what it's called, and I should know because I used it in school once. Uh, that makes a circle with a pin. Um, so this was this would be what he would use. Strap it onto a horse when he was ready to move on, and he did use it at several battles. It has tape measures, it has sketchbooks. So again, amazingly intact relic and and um i don't know as as we keep discovering the um the historical society has this just extraordinary range of artifacts that testify to not only um the art of war but the everyday life of war uh in addition, in this in this particular footlocker, Payne has a very interesting. Uh, uh, well, I think it, it might be in the footlocker. He perfected and held the patent for uh, for a, a tool that we uh, we still use, the uh, coiled flat steel tape measure, which is right. unique. I don't know if that's that in the corner there, but uh, he won he won a contest for his yeah. invention. Yeah, that's right, the retractable one. We absolutely still use it. It's a much smaller model, but I'd, I'd forgotten that detail that he was an inventor too, just like last week's hero, uh, John Erickson, on a slightly smaller scale. But we don't make many monitors today. We still make That's those right. papers. And you know, as, 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 you, as you've pointed out, Val, he, um, Payne used this in his subsequent engineering career, and we have some evidence that he was uh, helpful in the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, in the 1870s and, uh, and 80s, and uh, got a medal from uh, the chief engineer, Roebling, which he also just threw into the footlocker. There it is in the, uh, we have a little uh, silk that uh, advertises uh, Roebling right there in the, in the foreground of that image. Um, but back to this footlocker for just a second, uh, I think Payne saw some serious action and, and he, he recorded it uh, being a surveyor and a kind of, kind of guy who did that sort of thing. Um, where, where did he see action? Where did this footlocker see action? I think the most notable thing he saw and recorded in his diary was what we call the high water mark of the Confederacy. It's arguable in terms of military history, but he was on the scene for Pickett's charge on the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863. So he saw waves and waves of unprotected Confederates just massing and then marching and then running toward the Union lines and really being mowed down by artillery and then by gunfire. So he, he was witness to the last stand of the Confederacy in terms of invading the North. That never happened again after that day. And presumably this, this, this footlocker was as well. Um, yeah. Uh, did he use, is there evidence of the fact that he used the footlocker after the war. I mean, I, I presumably so. Yeah, I think um, th he. There are there are little souvenirs from from his prosaic and his exalted post-war career. Again, you know, the bridge was one, but I think he also worked on the Flushing Railroad. It sounds very unglamorous compared to Pickett's <laughs> Charge, but uh, it would be his his portable work desk. He was an he was an engineer in the field. <laughs> 
And um, I guess he must have thought after after the Battle of Gettysburg, all of this is gravy. I survived. My my baggage survived, and I'm just going to thank my lucky stars that I can have a civilian career in engineering. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, finally, our last object uh, this evening is a snare drum. So it's it's beautiful. It's highly decorative uh, and uh, aesthetically pleasing, but it served quite a utilitarian purpose in battle. Um, tell us what what drums were used for. First of all, I want to endorse what you said about what a great object. Um, look at the painted eagle and stars, and the eagle is clutching in its claw uh, an American flag. Um, it is. It is a. It, it's an amazing example, and um, so drums were not just for military bands. They were used in all aspects of camp life in the Civil War and probably more importantly in battle. So first of all, this the sound of the rat-a-tat-tat of the drum would be the first thing that a soldier heard um, every morning for Reveille. It would start with a drum roll and then the bugler. Um, you know, Irving Berlin famously said, I want to murder the bugler who wakes him up in the morning, but the drum came first. So they... Uh, the drum was used in camp life, and then also at, at the moments when um, soldiers did have leisure, there were bands uh, that performed in camp, and the drum was, of course, the rhythmic staple of the military band as well. But in battle, troops, if they were marching forward, marched off to the tapping of the drums. And... Um, they followed the drums. When the battles became smoke-filled and bullet-riddled and really scenes of confusion and mayhem, they, soldiers in precarious position listened for the sound of the drums because not only would that signal a place where they could uh, coalesce again or regroup, but also the drums were used for issuing orders. So, so you write that they're almost in a category of um, weapons. You know, we're, woe to the soldier who didn't understand the, yeah, the drum instructions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it had the power to, to inspire a kind of precision because of the rat-a-tat-tat, as you say. Right, and they marched so, in, in rhythm, absolutely. Uh, so who owned this drum? So I think we, we know that, um, although we don't know who made it, as the caption here, uh, indicates we we know that it was owned by a a drummer boy, as they were called, named um, really Charles Mosby, and I think although we don't have a picture of little Charlie, we do have uh, a drummer boy photograph in the next slide that shows just how yes. young and uh, innocent at first. Uh, so these these drummer boys were or is this actually is mosby okay this is oh, mosby. The, oh, the owner the yeah, owner is Philip the owner. sorry say it again val i'm sorry philip Correll. he was Correll, a 14 year old enlistee yes but this is a typical drummer boy looks petrified and right and, and this some is drummer a, boys they some were as young as seven years old which is is i think quite an extraordinary thing to contemplate yeah they were Extraordinary, extraordinarily young, and um, um, there was a lot of criticism of that by reform groups. Uh, they thought that these uh, youngsters, well, aside from being exposed to grave um, physical danger, that worse even, their souls were being subjected to the evils of camp life, like card playing and drinking. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that this was a generation that came of age too quickly. Some of them came because of unhappy home lives. Some of them uh, because of the romance of the military service, which they soon found out was not quite so romantic. Some went with fathers. Some went with older brothers. Um, and by the way, their life, when there wasn't a battle or wasn't a musical um, celebration was pretty dismal because 
They're expected to be like servants in camp, shining shoes, fetching things for soldiers. And although there were, you know, the wealthier officers would often give them tips um, to supplement their little salaries, the older soldiers, uh, I'm sorry, the poorer soldiers, the rougher guys, maybe the Zouaves, since they were the roughest, um, you know, were pretty abusive. They slapped them around. They, um, they teased them. Uh, so it was a very difficult life. Um, and some of them, you know, came out of the war, uh, or at least the, the genre of the drummer boy came out as another celebrated uh, kind of volunteer in, in wartime. There were 3,800 uh, soldiers that were age 16 or younger who actually served with the, the federal army. Uh, it's quite something. So yeah. um, do you know, do we know what happened to the owner of, of our drum, uh, Mr. Philip Correll? We know that he lived a long, long time. If think about a drummer boy of the Civil War who survived uh, two years into the presidency of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And he survived to see the World War I, the Depression, automobiles, airplanes, uh, and the New Deal. He lived until 1935. Um, um, he, he had served, by the way, in the 99th New York and um, served with a uh, general um, named Winfield Scott Hancock, uh, nothing demonstrates a transition from old-fashioned war to modern war than the fact that there was a general at the beginning of the war named Winfield Scott, and at the end of the war there was someone who had been named after him because Scott had already been famous in the war in the Mexican War. And Hancock was known as Hancock the Magnificent, so you can imagine that the drummer boy had to be spruce and the drum had to be beautiful, as we see. So um, we don't know much about his life, but um, we do know that. He, he, again, was at Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg, lived on to age 88, and I'm sure he told stories about the war for the rest of his life because the drummer boys were sort of inured to the, to the real fear, I think, in some ways. Sure. But they were also romanticized and, and memorialized later uh, in, in many different like, sort of artistic expressions. Yeah. They were uh, Winslow Homer and other artists did famous renderings of them, and um, uh, the most famous is probably uh, by William Morris Hunt, who heard about a uh, an episode at the Battle of Antietam where a drummer boy had been hit by a bullet and had looked up to one of the his older comrades and said, if you lift me up, I'll carry us, I'll drum us through. So Hunt did a portrait of Actually, Hunt did another drummer boy. This is Eastman Johnson, sorry. Eastman Johnson did a portrait of the drummer boy perched on this soldier's shoulders. So anatomically, it's probably impossible, but there he is sitting on a shoulder uh, and drumming away in the, in the midst of battle. And they were lionized in poetry and song. And uh, maybe in a way society made some excuses for the fact that uh, it had... Uh, Force these these young men into adulthood and danger well before their time. Absolutely. Uh, so we are uh, we're about ready for our Q and A, uh, and maybe we can uh, see the image of the four objects uh, once again. So uh, our first question is: Do many of these buttons that we show survive? Yeah, the buttons are hard to destroy unless you step on them and squash them. So it's one of the advantages of uh, metallic objects and, and and you know people still find the remnants of bullets and even artillery on civil war battlefields although I'm not recommending that we search because it's actually against the park service rules to to dig and forage and use metal detectors and all of that but what's amazing about these buttons and their survival and I think what makes them unique uh, is that the fellow who we presume snatched them personally did such a great job of cataloging them. I mean, he mounted them, he numbered them, he wrote a beautiful headline there. That's a handwritten Confederate buttons period. And then for each number, he listed the origin of the design of the button. 
now maybe museums have done that research for themselves, but I've never seen, others may have, but I never have never seen a collection of these relics cataloged at the time by the person who found them or sees them. So I think that makes this pretty unique. Absolutely. Uh, and at New York Historical, we also have collections of Revolutionary War buttons from the New York City area too. So they are very uh, durable objects. Uh, our next question is, are there comparable collections of Union Army buttons? Yeah, I mean, the Civil War Museum um, in um, uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania has, has a good collection. The um, the new Civil War Museum in Richmond, which is on the site of an old Confederate munitions factory called the Tredegar Works, has a collection. Um, I, I, see, I hear of them more in the South. I think the West Point Museum has a pretty good collection as well. Uh, and maybe in Gettysburg too, perhaps, at the museum there? Or the, uh, yeah, they do center. have a wonderful visitor center at the, and Cyclorama. <clears throat> and they, uh, yeah, they have a good collection as well. Mm -hmm. good so uh, was, was there standardization of Union and Confederate uniforms? And uh, did that apply to the fancier uniforms? Uh, yeah, I know. This was, a, this was a melange. This, as you can see from this Zouave uniform, which doesn't even seem to have any buttons, by the way. I think it has them on the back of the sleeve there. <clears throat> the uniforms were it's a very local affair at first. Um, so these buttons bore the, the uh, emblems of local units, local regiments. Um, they paid tribute to states uh, more than the national authority that had uh, called up the militia. So, so uh, they were not uh, uniform. <laughs> the uniforms were not uniform. And at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, at the Battle of Bull Run, there were enough Confederates wearing bluish uniforms to confuse a lot of people, including other Confederates and other Union men, who didn't quite know whether they were shooting at friends or enemies. Uh, well, later, yeah, later some Confederates were kind of a butternut color. So I think the, the Federal, the Union Army eventually was well-funded enough to approach a kind of uniform look, no pun intended, or pun intended, I guess. <laughs> Uh, there's a question the for Zouaves, me. Don't you think the Zouaves were always confusing? I mean, they, uh, that standing out, when artillery began to bear down, they, they were lucky if there was a little cluster of Zouaves, fire over there. Yeah. Something <laughs> scrambling. Well, we have, but they were all, there was a uniformity to the Zouave costume and you couldn't tell if they were Confederate or Union. Exactly, uh, that was another, yeah. another problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question for me, and that is how or when can we see the objects in these programs? Uh, well, uh, soon after this book uh, was published, we did have a, a mini exhibition of all of the, the 50 objects, but many of them remain on view uh, in our loose center on the fourth floor of New York Historical. And sooner than you know it, we will be back in uh, the museum and we'll be able to see them. So uh, we'd love to, uh, we should probably put a little label on the ones that we featured on this program. So you can and there's, see and them there's, in And there's much more. I know we're not, we have a little time and we're not, we don't have a special um, segment uh, devoted to flags. You could also mention that uh, <laughs> along the lines of beautifully preserved textiles that the Historical Society has some amazing flags, both North and South down, including a little palmetto flag that was flown at Fort Sumter. And um, one that I'm going to just talk a little bit about, even though we don't have a picture of it. So just think of a little American flag. We don't need too much imagination to conjure up that image. But, and, and this is a period in which um, we're witnessing or participating in um, demonstrations all over the city and all over the country. Um, after the Battle of Fort Sumter, which we talked about last week, um, an American flag, it was reported, had been trailed in the mud by the Confederates and then returned to Major Robert Anderson, who took it back to New York. And uh, that flag was, was shown at Union Square at a demonstration of 100,000 people. But the Historical Society has one of the little flags that a lady put on her window, 
maybe on Broadway or on Fifth Avenue in Lower Manhattan, to demonstrate her loyalty. And if you look, do research at the Historical Society, which I, I did for this book and have done on several occasions, you find out that um, flag merchants upped the prices of flags. You could see it in the advertisements and sold out really quickly, just as they sold out of black crepe when, uh, when Lincoln's funeral headed to New York. So I, I'm just amazed at the textiles um, in the collection. That they, and they survived too. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know what, Valk, may I ask you a question? Sure. <laughs> okay. So what kind of preservation uh, efforts have to be made to keep a uniform like this intact and not just falling into pieces? It's, uh, it's quite uh, almost scientific. We have uh, great uh, technicians and conservators on staff who, who monitor the, uh, the deterioration of, of the uh, textiles, uh, which is one reason why they cannot be on view for longer than maybe right. three months tops. And then we put them uh, aside and then wait several years before we can show them again. So, uh, but you know, the conservation uh, efforts with the proper kind of boxes, the proper kind of temperature control, yeah, all of those things imagine. go into it. Yeah, no, it's, it's complicated, but the, the colors on this uh, particular costume are just so vivid that, uh, yeah, it is, it, it is a testament to our conservators on staff that, that it's survived. And also the conservators, the conservators are dealt with it in its first 50 years before these modern chemical and refrigeration preservation techniques were in hand. That's what's so amazing about this. Exactly. Um, here's a question about the Zouave uniforms, and you probably can answer this because it also includes Lincoln. Uh, how did he feel <laughs> about these Zouave uniforms? Well... He loved the displays. He loved the drills. He loved, again, you know, we, we're, we're looking at it and laughing at the pajamas, but these guys were the proudest and the most um, uninhibited and uh, fearless. You have to be very fearless to wear white booties and, um, and a sarong. A little hat and, <laughs> and a hat. fez, right. So, no, I, Lincoln was a great fan of watching um, military parades, uh, both those that went by the White House in the early days of the war. He was always on hand with his hat over his heart as the flag went by and the soldiers went by. And when he visited the troops in Virginia, as he did fairly often, he marched up and down, well, he rode up and down the lines inspecting. So he would have seen these and they were always pointed out to him as the, again, as the roughest and toughest guys. And of course, having known Ellsworth, having seen him, with his command around the White House, he was used to them and, um, and felt that they also represented volunteerism because all of this was before the draft. Um, these were guys who volunteered not only to serve, but to wear this, uh, this kind of a out there outfit. <laughs> Uh, uh, here's another question about uh, the Zouave uniforms, and that is, did McClellan help introduce uh, the Zouaves into the Union Army? And how did Grant feel about them? Oh, um, that, that's a very good question. So no, they were embedded in the service, in the, in the, uh, the uh, service before McClellan became commander. Remember, he doesn't take command until after the Battle of Bull Run, and there had been Zwabs um, at the battle. And by, by the way, I would point out, uh, Winslow Homer once said, these guys must be crazy, in short, you know, to be out there. <laughs> Although he did some beautiful, beautiful paintings of camp life that are at the Metropolitan Museum of Zouaves playing uh, pitching quoits and lounging around in camp. So they, they, um, they wore these, but no, they weren't. One would, it's a good um, supposition to say that McClellan was involved because he was pretty flamboyant in his own way. Um, but no, they, they were in the service before. And Grant, I don't know the answer, but one would assume that the, that the soldiers who were marching south relentlessly um, through the wilderness, Cold Harbor, and, you know, in that awful spring and summer of 1864, and were in the trenches before Petersburg in early 1865, I would guess by this time were not, there were not many Zouaves in the regiment. Uh Another question about uh, souvenirs like the buttons. Uh, were they uh, collected for bragging rights or for their market value? I think they were. It's a, another really good question. 
I would say bragging rights in terms of intimidating enemy prisoners and humiliating enemy prisoners. Uh, not so much monetary value, but um, souvenir value. I was there. I was at. I was in the fray, and this, you know, in the same way that um, American soldiers in World War II collected detritus, uh, in, including weapons, enemy weapons, German and Japanese weapons that the, and sabers that they were told they couldn't bring back. They somehow managed to bring back. There's something about uh, the "I've been to the war and here's the evidence" mentality that's very, very powerful, and I understand. Indeed. Uh, next question. Did Lincoln have a point of view regarding looting? Yes. Um, it, remember, there was a fine line between foraging and looting. And um, there was a code of conduct in the service that was pretty rigidly enforced at that time. There was no abuse of women on the home front. And exceptions were punished pretty, pretty toughly. Uh, but eventually, the the Union and Confederate armies could not supply themselves sufficiently, so they had to live off the land. And that meant, particularly when, let's say, Robert E. Lee marched into Maryland in 1862 with a very thin supply line, um, that meant taking whatever they wanted. So their pillaging involved chickens and cows and uh, apples, uh, Lee... Lee marched into Maryland at apple, apple harvesting time. So he practically took every apple off every tree in Maryland. And by the way, let's say one thing else about Robert E. Lee, who's most pretty much in the news today, again, because of the statues controversies, but uh, Robert E. Lee also took as hideous souvenirs, free black men and sold them back into slavery he could in the South. So he captured free people and enslaved them. That was the most hideous of all the souvenirs. And of course, then we go to Sherman um, um, in, in late 1864, who, f who forages his way through Georgia. And you know, there are two points of view on that. One is that he burned Georgia, and the other is that he spared Georgia in some ways by not engaging in a major battle. Um, here's one well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a teaser. When we talk about Appomattox in a future program, I'm going to talk about another, another famous bit of souvenir hunting. I'll save it for that. Save it for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, we have a few minutes left uh, and a couple more questions. Uh, who made Ooh. these uniforms and how expensive were they? Were any made in New York City? I would say they were, these were expensive. Uh, some were, you know, there were some soldiers paid themselves. The, uh, the, the Union Army gave an allotment to soldiers to buy uniforms. But I'm sure that these were fun, funded by philanthropic groups in the states where they were raised. Because again, there was certain pride um, of, of wearing the Zawab uniforms. Let me, let me point one thing out. Um, we talk about systemic racism and how long it's existed. Back in the Civil War, even when African-American troops were finally allowed to volunteer to risk their lives to save the country and end slavery, um, white soldiers were given an allowance to buy uniforms. Black soldiers had the cost deducted from their salary for the first few months of their service. And Frederick Douglass came to Lincoln to protest not only that the soldiers were getting a lower pay grade, but that they had to pay for their own uniforms, unlike the white soldiers. And Lincoln said, and he was sorry, but we had to do it this way in the beginning to just get the white soldiers past this revolution of an integrated army, which wasn't really integrated, but had separate black units. So that's, that's sort of a sad aspect of, there was uniform courage but the government did not have the courage to treat all uniforms and their soldiers equally. Indeed. Uh, oh, uh, let's see, we have one minute left. So okay. <laughs> was there any, uh, one more question, was there any martial etiquette against killing drummer boys? You know, I don't, I would, I would think that once the smoke fills 
fills um, a battlefield, bullets go where they go, and drummer boys were wounded. Um, that's a great question. We'll ask people to write in to us and tell us if they know if etiquette forbade. Yeah. I hate ending on a question I don't know the answer to, but there we go. It's inevitable. Well, but uniform courage is our theme, and certainly the drummer boys were, uh, were exemplars of that. Yeah. Um, so I am afraid we are out of time. So Harold, thank you again for being a font of fascinating information. And Thanks, uh, thank, it's great partnering thank with you. you. It's so much fun. Um, and thank you uh, to all of you out there watching and listening. And again, thank you for your support. We'll see you again next week. Good night. Good night.